So, um, for those who didn't, you know, who weren't there yesterday, you missed out a lot, and there's only one thing I can say for you. Where the heck have you been? Because, <laughs> yeah, I'm just sorry. We, you know, we had a lot of interesting conversations, and uh, we had a lot of um, keynote speakers, you know, and uh, the atmosphere was just, you know, incredible. But then, uh, not to worry, because today we also have a lot of interesting speakers lined up for today. And we also have a, a night event uh, later on in the evening. So for those who managed to book, uh, to pay for that uh, night event when they were um, registering for the conference, please co collect your tickets uh, at registration, at the registration table outside. You can speak to the lady, Melissa Mulli. She can be able to help you with that. And for those who haven't been able to uh, purchase those uh, tickets, you can still be able to do that today. And I understand it's going to be like 100 rand for, 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 for that dinner event, which is, I think is very reasonable because it's going to be like a very huge event and there's going to be like incredible performance there um, as we spoke yesterday. So please do that and make sure that you have your ticket ready for the evening event. So without wasting much time, um, I'm going to introduce uh, the first uh, keynote speaker we have for this morning. Um, it's Professor Tiffany Willoughby Harold, uh, and she's no stranger to WICKET at the Bits Center for Diversity Studies since we've been like working with her through a lot of our um, uh, projects. So Professor Tiffany Willoughby Harold, uh, Associate Professor, Amer African American Studies, University of California, Ivan, researches black political thought and the material conditions of knowledge production black radical movements and rest gender consciousness, and queer and sexual sexualities internationally, and has uh, as several roles in publishing as the managing editor of the National Political Science, Science Review and is one of the history, social, science book review editors for Safundi, the Journal of South African and American Studies. She's the author of West um, of a white skin, the Carnegie Corporation and the Racial Logic of White Vulnerability, University of California Press 2015, which emphasizes transnational linkages that made poor whites the central currency for US and South African intellectuals, philanthropists, and race relations policies makers, and she's the editor of the theories of blackness or life and death and guest editor of numerous special issues including black feminism and Afro-pessimism. She also co-edited co with M. Shabi Malanklu in Theory and Event, challenging the legacies of racial resentment, black health activism, educational justice, and legislative leadership. That's quite a mouthful there, eh? and it keeps on going. Um, yeah, and then uh, her work is published in Contemporary Abolition, Journal of Contemporary Thought, Cultural Dynamics, African Identities, Social Justice, National Political Science Review, Politics, Groups and Identities, South African Review of Social, New Political Science, Kroba, Anthropological uh, Society Papers, Race and Class, and in the Anthology, Shout Out. Women of Color Respond to Violence, edited by Barbara Aich and Maria Ochoa. She is also the winner of the 2017 Association for the Study of Black Women in Politics, May C. King. And uh, she's also distinct, she has also a distinguished paper award on women, gender, and black politics. And the 2015 and 2011 UC Ivin Chancellor's Award for fostering undergrad, undergraduate uh, research. She is a member of the LGBTQI caucus uh, of the National Conference of Black Political Scientists and the president of the LGBTQI caucus of the American Political Science Association in past co-chair of the Ken Sherrill Beth Dissertation on Sexual and Political Prize Award Committee. So yeah. Without wasting time, uh, Professor, what about it? Give it a shot.
would like to thank the Center for Diversity Studies and um, my colleagues here for giving me the opportunity to share a little bit of this work with you. And I appreciate the mission of the Center for Diversity Studies and the work that you all do. So um, this paper is actually 50 minutes, so I'm just going to go through it, but I will break it up with some kind of poetic and musical thing so that it won't be so long. <laughs> This paper is dedicated to the dreams of the wise ones from before who imagine us and to the embattled young ones who are being made to remake a history from shards. They ought not be made to remake the wheel, but should be handed the tapestry of what we did if it can be passed on, if it can be passed on. If it can be shown that something that we fought for has something to do, anything to do with the battles that must be fought by them today, can we do more to share the past, broken though it is? If we show our scars, perhaps. If some of our sermons are screams, perhaps. If it is not neat and nice and easily digestible, they may, in fact, have ears to hear this vomit of our history, these things that make us landless, we who can only be because this land breathes for us and keeps us on the run today. <coughs> in my larger work, body of work, I show that black internationalist feminist thought and its cross-generational political responsibility, to use Lewis Gordon's phrase, highlights rebellion, commitment, and the capacity to break systems like racial chattel slavery all over the planet. Such systems reemerge because white modernity and multicultural modernity continue to believe in slave democracy and its attendant churning up of our wombs, graves, altars, relations, and households, modeling the importance of rebellion wherever it is necessary and moving across sites of struggle, these activist thinkers have taught me to keep political visions limber, autonomous, fidgety, if you will, and to refuse to believe that we have figured everything out. We haven't. Radical Dharma and prison abolitionist activist Yasmin Saidula explains such political visions and how they flourish in the language of fugitivity and restlessness and placelessness not as a principle, but because when we associate our bodies with places, our bodies with places, those places get marked as sites of detention and murder until we are no longer there. And the places are marketed primarily as having been made beautiful again once we have been forcibly removed. The ideology that slavery can be tolerated has to be undone in every single place possible and most especially in the places in our own hearts as black people where we accept the violence of subjection and domination and reproduce it on the people we love the most. The world that animates these kinds of political visions commits to these things. One, the debased and degraded, sold and forgotten exceed the limits of violence and subjection and the lie that they are less, less than. Two, a world exists and can be constantly recreated that exceeds national boundaries and reveals all national boundaries to be forms of segregation. Three, the position of the black as a politics is made up of both blackness unitary and the significance of blackness plural, what I've called in past uh, the black rainbow. The paper I'm going to give today contributes to one of the lesser studied sources of black women's politics in South Africa. And so I focus on print culture and the genres and disciplines and practices that black women have used to write themselves and entire societies into self-knowing, political consciousness raising, and organized mobilization across generations in a fairly persistent and enduring fashion. In 2007, historian Noboniso Gasa wrote that black women's consciousness is, quote, best understood as an ongoing journey 
textured by historical interruption, but continuing nonetheless, end quote. If Gaza is correct about the enduring nature of black women's politics and consciousness, much of our work as students of the present and students of the past requires us to search out people who in the generations past took time to extravagantly reflect on and interpret their roles as learners and university students. Fatima Mir is such a person, an activist sociologist of Indian descent and one of the founders of the Federation of Black South African Women educated at the segregated University of Natal. The ancestors gave me to work on her and so I tend to be obedient to what they ask me to do. Mir's black feminism was steeped in a philosophy of revolutionary mothering, cross-generational organizing, ideological cross-fertilization, and defending the lives of black children and interrupting racial colonialism's insistence on shattering black kin relations. I am interested in Mir's publication practices and the network of scholar activists, journalists, and anti-apartheid lawyers that she was embedded in as a model for autonomous life at the university for black women. I am interested in her having a job as a lecturer while being a banned person, <laughs> while she and her spouse were banned persons, while watching the same university that she was employed by prohibit her daughter from attending that university when it decided to deepen its commitment to segregation. I want us to remember lecturers like Fatima Mir, faults and all, in hopes that the next generation will pursue research on what my librarian friend, the late anti-apartheid activist Pauline Manaka called, topics that are to our hearts and to our struggles. Today I'm going to share two texts. Mir's pamphlet that she first published in 1986 after testifying on behalf of a young man that the state planned to execute, and two, a short story that she published the year after the state murdered him. Print culture in her writing life as a creative writer of sociology and fiction and oratory and news articles were essential tools in her arsenal and organizing strategy. Mir's 1986 pamphlet, The Trial of Andrew Zondo, sought to humanize him and make inequality legible to a largely white international audience. By her republication of the pamphlet in 1998, Mir calls Zondo a martyr of the war against apartheid. She's no longer trying to humanize him. She's just trying to indict apartheid. In this 1998 version, she highlights the three decades of sacrifice by young people to destabilize apartheid's everyday practices of governmentality and sociality and chastises the ANC as the post-1994 government in power for not having commuted his sentence, though readily memorializing him and using his name on street signs in elementary schools. Unlike in the 1986 version, by 1998, Mir writes, quote, his trial was an indictment against the racist regime and its justice system, end quote, pointing to the ways that all the practices, procedures, protocols, patterns of organization, institutions, and meanings that devolved from the trial were certain to produce similarly violent results. By 1998, Mir could, could be considerably more explicit about the fact that the apartheid social order was organized around killing young black people and legitimizing those murders through every bureaucratic mechanism at its fingertips. By 1998, Mir placed Zondo among other sacrifice luminaries, like Chris Hani, like Robert Zabukwe, like Blessing Nanella, like Steve Biko, and like all of the women activists who lived with the suffering of having um, survived. Thereby providing a subtle and latent critique of contemporary South African political leadership. By this, Mir indicated that the living have inherited and, inherited and sullied the tradition that catapulted the post-1994 period into material possibility. For Mir, everyday young people who were the soldiers in the war against apartheid deserve a special and particular type of remembrance and insertion in the history that is being fought over and fought for. 
writing in defense of black children. In agreeing to testify on behalf of Andrew Zondo, a young man who had confessed to bombing a shopping mall in Natal on December 23, 1985, Fatima Mir participated in a long line of black feminist radical action against the racial state and in defense of black people. Zondo was raised in Kwamashu, son of Reverend Aiken and wife Lakina and sister of Irene. By the February 1986 day, when his parents both learned about Andrew's connection to the bombing from Radio Zulu and Daily Mail stories, Mir had already herself been imprisoned for 113 days in 1976, along with other struggle stalwarts. Andrew's father explained to me in an April 2018 interview that Mir was the only person who came to see the family after Zondo was arrested. At that time, young Andrew's activism was neither safe nor public, publicly supported by their neighbors or community. The indelicate terrain of the courthouse witness stand offered Mir a hostile geography. On the one hand, her own and her family's decades of scholarly militant activism in the anti-apartheid movement granted her the status of a courtroom expert, an academic native informant, and an honorary white because she could be trusted to follow the established legal protocols, knowing firsthand it is important for political prisoners to know their rights and demand that their rights be protected. But on the other hand, her attempts to upend the legal process by making the law empathize with Andrew's life and the ethical systems that compelled him to fight the South African state through force of arms were rejected by the court outright. As black radical scholars have agreed, activist lawyerly strategies and courtroom politics across different juridical and institutional sites are largely complementary to the practices of organized mass meetings, publishing broadsides and pamphlets and short stories and detention memoirs that compel people to change their understanding of events, of histories that they lived through. The courtroom, with all of its beautiful rhetoric and precedent and protocol, gave Fatima Mir and the other lawyers who worked on Zondo's case one platform, but not necessarily the most important one, to make meaning of the bombing of the Amanzim Toti Mall. Indeed, something that must be remembered is that most of our fighting will happen not in the courtroom or through the processes of legalism, but outside of such sanctified and ideologically sanitized spaces. And yet, the battles fought in the courtroom should also remain unceded ground. The courtroom, as it were, and as we all know, could only fail because it's never been a space designed to cover and protect the likes of Andrew Zondo. And as we all know, the courtroom was not a space designed to enlarge and make sense of the life that he lived and the fact that his choice reflected the value of other black lives lost and taken as so much chaff and waste. I'm gonna take a moment here to think with a group of anti-apartheid lawyerly strategies in the US, part of the diaspora, that I think offer some insight to Zondo's case and Mir's presence in it. A lot of other political commitments have to be in place so that anti-apartheid lawyering can do its work of defending our rights and criticizing the legal system and its processes as the problem, full stop. So there's a documentary that I, I really like that I teach often that was published by California News Reel on um, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund attorney Charles Hamilton Houston. The documentary is very old. It's entitled The Road to Brown, uh, referencing Brown versus Board of Education. The legal team that defended the League of Revolutionary Workers, similarly like this uh, group that uh, organized the trial that got us to Brown v. Board of Education, that legal team um, was defending a working class Detroit, Michigan organization led by black factory worker intellectuals and that spent time producing newspapers, um, organizing at schools, organizing in factories, organizing in polling booths, basically refusing to cede any ground anywhere. In fact, you have to have that kind of level of mobilization happening in order for people to enter the courtroom and do the kinds of um, lawyerly activism that doesn't just defend the person based on their rights, but actually indicts the court, indicts the entire legal process. 
So I'm starting, because of reading about this trial of Zondo, to look for other cases and instantiations of this. In the 1980s, South African attorneys that defended young black people from police brutality and state murder found themselves and their communities assassinated in ritualized lynchings. The legal firm in Plangi, Ingwani, and Shezi that worked on Andrew Zondo's trial had to wrestle with not only the sheer violence of illegal processes and its rhetorics, regimes, and practices of authority, but with having been warriors in the fight against apartheid in their own lives. They, too, lost their lives in fighting apartheid. And I mean literally. The attorneys that worked on the Andrew Zondo case literally, literally were targeted by the apartheid state. Mir's framing of the state terror and the security police that propped it up came from her being part of the legal community's fight against apartheid. Not only was her husband, Ismail, an attorney and had been, who had been banned many times, but she was part of a network of families of lawyers that defended um, all different kinds of people and that experienced serial bannings across the course of their life. Mir explained that the first time she was subjected to a banning order, the thing that it, you know, it's, you know, kicked off this banning order was that she had stated publicly in a speech, quote, freedom will come slowly but surely. Mere seemingly innocuous words of Western liberal political philosophy coming from the mouth of an activist master of rhetoric and the use of writing in the news, writing in the courtroom, and writing in academic journals signal the existence of intellectual dynamite stored carefully in every household in South Africa. Attorney Griffiths McNamee was murdered in 1981, and attorney Victoria McNamee, his surviving spouse and a militant activist in her own right, was killed on her doorstop in Mlazi after speaking at the July 1985 funeral in Craddock of Matthew Goniwe, Fort Kalata, Sparrow and Conto, and Zifero Nglali, all members of the Craddock Residents Association, Credora. The 50,000 mourners at that funeral drew strength from the legal defense prepared by McClangy, because not only was she a trained nurse and an attorney, but she had an incredible struggle legacy that was well known around the country. According to historians of South African history online, she had, quote, defended the United Democratic Front youth leaders and the Natal Indian Congress in the 1984 treason trial and had plowed her financial resources into a distinctly politicized memorial for her husband, founding a bursary in his name. She was a member of the Release Nelson Mandela Committee, the National Organization of Women, and the Natal Treasurer of the United Democratic Front." End quote. So what of the critique of legalism in the period since 1994? Like so many others, I no longer refer to our moment as post-apartheid because of the many forms of violence that are obscured by that account. But what do people say about the critique of legalism? Where are we right now? Sean Johnson's acclaimed novel, The Native Commissioner, sheds light on, quote, what made the role of the European jurist in Africa both invalid and not useful. Johnson's protagonist, George Jameson, is the most well-meaning sort of Natal-born European judge. He sees himself as having been appointed to defend the interests of the subjugated. Despite his rare skills at, quote, speaking and reading and writing in excellent Osa, Zulu, and Sutu, George, our protagonist, must admit the total ethical failure of working within a bureaucracy of a white minority government. Learning during his final stay in an asylum just weeks before committing suicide that there was nothing sacred about European colonial law or South African constitutionalism, George finally confronts and is undone by the fact that the totality of the colonial system was an unwanted imposition. As native commissioner, his world is nullified by a question of a young accused at court. He's having this memory while he's in the asylum. The accused, in Tabaka, poses the simple question. My lord, I understand that we will be found guilty and that we will be punished. This I understand, but I wish to ask this. 
What has it to do with you, sir? In this moment, in Tabaka is suggesting that colonial law has no answers. It can provide no remedies. It can provide no insight. It cannot adjudicate. It is useless. We are 100 pages into the novel before we realize that it is constitutionalism and European laws drug, dubbed as good intentions that have broken the protagonist and laid bare one of the most important questions of racialized colonialism and white minority rule, which it often hides behind. In Tabaka, the young accused reveals that there is no moral authority that can absolve him of guilt or condemn him. There is only the raw power and violence of that law, which all the time insists that its procedures and precedent and regimens and practices and duty-bound impartiality cleanse it from a flamboyant delight in power. It is the power that is behind the law that Mir excavates and compels readers to be flooded by in the trial of Andrew Zondo and other such cases like it. Most of the 5,000 martyrs killed by the South African state in the period between 1983 and 1985 inside the borders of South Africa and the unnamed thousands killed in exile across the continent and the tens of thousands of survivors that mourn them still in 2018 cannot be soothed by judges realizing only too late that their position of authority was wasted in propping up apartheid. Though the ethical moral bodies of survivors may have been freed through forgiveness, their psychic and emotional bodies are, as Reverend Aiken, the father of Andrew, explained, quote, I am not beyond hurt. Zondo's case is shaped by a context of the murders described above, but also, according to the writings of Winnie Mandela, by at least a decade of state executions of political prisoners that were not suicides. Marikizela Mandela inscribes, quote, all of these deaths were murders, as we knew at the time and were confirmed later, end quote. The police had information and training about how to affect such murders in detention anyway. And Zondo's case was an echo of a century of public hangings like the multiple Poco rebellions. Andrew despaired at having mistakenly killed civilians, and yet he refused to defend himself. Like in Tabaka, he said, I know I'm guilty. He refused the retelling of his contributions to the war against the apartheid state becoming a sympathetic act of political violence. He refused to make his state execution redeemable or fair or to allow resolution to be achieved. He did not wish to become a cause celeb. His story would not become the basis for campaigns for rights. Rather, Zondo's actions during the trial for his life were a rejection, full stop, of any imbrication inside the legal system. The enduring failures of white legality are partially what made writing the trial of Andrew Zondo such an important contribution. In that text, Muir could rearticulate, one, the political and legal strategy to render Zondo into a person beyond condemnation and execution, and two, could advance the project of revealing the South African legal system to be deeply invested in propping up the system of apartheid. The legal strategy failed, but the literary accounts of his trial live on. The legal apparatus served apartheid in countless ways. Following philosopher Indumiso de la Gla, most scholars would admit hardly that the same constitutionalism has had within it the ability to extend the life of apartheid by other means post-1994, while being deemed at the same time the most important tool in the arsenal of rooting out apartheid. There's a paradox to, to chew on for a while. Hmm? Institutionalized despair, hope. Yeah. When people talk about the Rainbow Nation and South Africa's constitution being the best constitution in the world, and the children born after 1994 as being the born frees, they are, as my mother used to say, telling lies. Those narratives that suppress the lives lost in order to pretend that legal re reconciliation has provided the necessary answers. So we're going to do a transition. It's going to come on really loud. So you might want to it
Transition. That's a song by Sweet Honey in the Rock. I want to turn now to the second text by Mir. Just a year after the state murdered Andrew Zondo, Mir published a short story in an anthology of South African women's writings, which indicates that black women's political work has never been just weeping and mourning over those lost. Certainly not a lament of subordination. Amapekula, terrorist, published in 1987, is an extension of the work that Mir had done for most of her life up to that point, ending the basic narrative of South African society about itself and the basis of its authority and legitimacy. If the state was nothing more than a site of the reproduction of cruelty, as we learn from reading Mir's interpretation of the society, then such a state deserved to be removed and cast into the uttermost parts of forgetfulness. In this short story, two young men are brought to the home of Salusha, a well-loved Induna's rural crawl to hide and seek refuge. They and the community they enter will be safer if the latter do not actually know what the youth are going to do and what kind of organizing they're involved in. The youth, Temba and Impumalelo, quote, found small things, big things that needed doing, and they organized the young people to do it with them. They appeared to be inspiring a new spirit, especially among the jobless youth. They appeared to have a sense of purpose. The youth jogged with Temba and Impumalelo in the early mornings and in the evenings. They played football. They repaired the roads. They took an interest in Salusha's court when it was in session under the tree, sat quietly by and listened respectfully." End quote. The sometimes narrator of the short story, Salusha, describes the day of his arrest and why he had not reported the presence of the two young men to the police as quote unquote strangers, for they were as his own sons. It was not simply their age that made them like sons, it was their heart and their joyfulness and their willingness to work and their effectiveness at working with other young people. They were trusted because of what they did in the community. Their formal community assessment saw resources of self-determination and dignity and energy that could be the basis for good. They just got there and went to work. Salusha so indicated to the police during his interrogation that he had reported to the police when he saw two white men passing through. But these, these young people, they had come to belong in the community. Their belonging to the community added strength and self-regard and developed trust and love. The police arrested Salusha in front of his people, leader of eight neighborhoods bundled into the back of a police van. Certainly a powerful organized force like a group of police with the power to carry weapons and use them to kill people. A constabulary that insisted that those who you regard as your own children have to be reported on and given up. Those are the capricious dictates of state terrorists. Mir's point in calling this story Amapekula is that the state is the terrorist not the youth that are trying to survive it. It was this kind of account of the apartheid state that Mir wrote and published that demonstrated the state's inaction of its will to terrorize. <laughs> the state wanted these youth to be pulled aside and separated because they had the capacities of catalysts. They asked questions and waited purposefully for answers. These youth could inspire and tap the energy of self-determination in the community. Their peers respected them and were motivated by them. 
and for Solutia, who wanted young people to stay in the community and add their inventiveness and experiences and not head to the mines and the back houses and kitchens to all the degradation that was part of their growing up in those places far away. Tembu and Impumalela were a welcome addition to the family. Solutia explained, it was only in court that he realized they had gone about in that matter so quietly and so cautiously that he had known nothing about it. They had wanted the young men in the area to bear arms against the white government, and they had, according to the police, enticed several young men in his area, including his two sons. The police tortured Salusha for having accepted these young men into his crawl and letting them motivate and encourage other young people. Salusha was punished for not allowing the police state and its violence to decide what happened next in his community. State terrorism disparaged and disregarded all the authority that he represented in the long legacy of governance and decision making and resolving problems with processes of consensus and debate. State terror revealed that it allowed customary rulers to have their place for its own convenience as a mere decoration and symbolic suggestion that African people still had authority. But state terror revealed in its treatment of Seleucia that his authority could be reduced to nothing. Mir's searing description of the police torturing Seleucia explains that, quote, they had kicked him and twisted his neck and boxed him about the ears so that his teeth had rattled in his mouth and some had fallen out. They made him pick up heavy objects and put these on his head and stand with them for hours until his legs had buckled and he had thought he would fall. They had struck him on his bare back with open hands until the skin had peeled and they had gripped his forefinger between two sticks and squeezed until all the blood had, trained the, had drained the end and congealed under his nail. Such things had happened to him that it was not dignified to talk of them. Mir describes what happens to Seleucia in detail to concretize the material violence of apartheid and help readers understand what kind of psychic conditions of shock and disturbance and uncertainty torture victims were put through. In her interpretation of the ways that such forms of violence extend far beyond the body of the individual person being tortured, LaShonda Carter explains that state torture touches the bodies and lingers in the lives of the members of families that care for the person subjected to such violence. These other persons, boys and girls and men and women, are gendered through watching Seleucia be abducted, arrested, seeing him return with a broken body that was formerly strong and fit, and repairing his physical body through intensive care. Katazile, Salusha's adopted daughter, was there when the police dropped off Salusha after detaining him and breaking his body. She was there by ancestral destiny and sacred appointment, mistakenly called a happen chance, happenstance and pure chance by Mir, as the police released, quote, whatever was left of Salusha. She was bidden to witness and watch. Through each of these stages of the spectacular and quotidian forms of sexualized violence that constitute police torture, Salusha's relations must decide how they will respond, who he has become, and what they have become as witnesses to torture. In this uh, reading, I'm drawing on Marnia Lazarek's books, Torture and the Twilight of Empire, and Barbara Harlow's book, Bard, Women, Writing, and Political Detention. If readers think Mir's unrelenting account of the state as terrorist is completed with the breaking of Seleucia, that is not to be. Mir painstakingly describes the same police that tried to destroy Seleucia and the people he loved, following up with the ugly street harassment of Katazile by police. So she's there witnessing her father being returned, and the police decide to let her know what her status is as well. Compelled to be the reluctant witness of Seleucia at his release, alone and separate from the rest of the family, the police catcall Katazile and talk to her in overly familiar and seductive fashion. Mir exclaims with disgust and horror at the police officer regarding Katazile as if, quote, she was his for the picking. In this horrifically shaming moment of witnessing her father having been savaged and broken, Mir describes the police hailing young Katazile as if their flirtations were welcome forms of address. 
The same police officer that had just a moment before been offering Katazile an unwanted moment of bitter intimacy then switched tactics and, quote, threatened to put her down that moment if she did not stop her whining, to murder her, to donner her for weeping when she saw her adopted father battered and bruised and likely sexually assaulted. The public shouted police warnings were evidence of these switched tactics. Katazile was by position, rank, and status in a society available to be raped or murdered or both, to be made an informer, to be made a target for more gender-based violence designed specifically for her social position. Gendered precisely through torture and state terrorism, Katazile and Salusha share an identity in the world that is only deepened when the police arrest and detain her along with him without conviction for over a year. Mir figures Salusha as a person of strength and authority that could not be broken or bowed in the end. She writes, for all the assaults and despite his age, Salusha had been like a bull through it all. Why are you assaulting me, he had shouted. I am not an informer. And this had made the black policeman even angrier. State violence misrecognized the youth and designated them dangerous and not kin, not normal beneficiaries of mutual obligation. Or if kin, then folks that revealed how dangerous Seleucia and his people actually were. If Seleucia could not slave for and serve the terrorist state by recognizing its interests and prioritizing those interests above his own people's, he was a weak link in a system of domination and subjection that relied on his using his power against his own interests. But Seleucia continued to love the youth, to view them as his sons. He was targeted for punishment and torture because of his protection of these youth and the way that his protection reveals that he had been operating from a distinctively antagonistic framework of political life and political commitment. Seleucia had never rejected self-defense. Instead, Salusha and his people valued those young men and their skills and their fight. Salusha had realized, even before they had arrested him, that they were looking for Temba and Impumalelo, and had begun to wonder what it was the boys had done. But with that wondering, there had also developed in him a protective shield for them. Hmm. Instead of being a bland report or even a convincing and insightful application of a particular sociological theory, Mir's story about a family terrorized by the state and accused of being members of the ANC and accused of harboring two completely promising young, young people, Mir's story is literary and creative and crafted to figure the young people as rural youth community workers. Her writing and her habits of working in collective spaces with other activists demonstrate how powerfully literary work and advocacy can be as a practice of political activism. These two texts, The Trial of Andrew Zondo and Amapé Kula, indicate a deep political commitment to cross-generational listening and mutuality. Mir epitomizes the writerly life of those black internationalist feminists in the 1800s and 1900s that historians Dale Gore, Jean Theo Harris, Keisha Blaine, and Brandy Thomas Wells, and their dozens and dozens and dozens of collaborators have written about. I'm gonna close this paper up with a love letter to those generations born in the wake of the fist up, froze out protests at Pretoria Girls High School the activists of Fees Must Fall and the activists of the Total Shutdown. Dear ones, those who are myself and my heart walking in the world, Tania Wilson and Kinsani Maseko and Bangani Mayosi, pray for us who you left behind. Give us something to understand how to survive the terrible tragedies that took you away from us. While the news media and cultural critics have perhaps gotten this born free nomenclature wrong through poor translation of Sutu names that are better translated as 
I meant for you to be free, not you are born free. And through a naive hope that everything could be magically changed in socialization of young people, Work on black girlhood in South Africa like that done by my colleague Latoya Williams offers us reasons to pause. Such pause and quiet of necessity provides a chance to reflect on why so many young people defended and identified with Mama Nozamo Winnie Malikizela Mandela upon her passing. Without necessarily having the empirical evidence that a counterintelligence program had created the violence that resulted in the terrible tragedy of the loss of Stampisepe. Most young people in South Africa today, both men and women, <laughs> remain skeptical of the state's rendering of Mama Winnie as an easily caricatured symbol of state power and authority. Most people, we learned in that social media campaign and all of those thousands of people in South Africa and across the world who wore headscarves and dukes of every size and proportion that they believed in her militancy. They were sustained by her as unbroken and unbowed and by a person who was not just a social worker but a person who <coughs> knew how to work in the social. Roads must fall and fees must fall and hashtag I am Nozamo and hashtag she did not die, she multiplied. And the many iterations of these sentiments among social media activists around the world is evidence of several important and critical social and political realignments. These fists in the air are the kinds of political commitments that deserve to be studied carefully. And talking about memory and reflections and moments of profound loss, we are also talking about transgenerational processes of people inheriting power. Say to yourself, I inherit power. I inherit power. <laughs> we inherit power in ways that defy empirical and rational positivist accounts of organizational success and failure. When young South African women reclaim their names and understand whatever snippets of stories are left for them about why they were named after this particular relative or that particular re relative or this particular state of affairs or set of conditions that face their parents, they are taking on the work of liberation. Being told that you are a member of a generation called Born Freeze makes you disconnected from history and enables you only to be marketed to because you are young and because your parents want to demonstrate to themselves and to their own peers that your arrival signals that something has changed. But when a person comes to understand that their name means something more like, I meant for you to be free, it puts the onus on that person to take whatever freedom might mean to them into their own hands and imagine and work with their political commitments while bearing the truth that no generation can really give another generation its freedom. This name means I give you the purpose and choice to do something with the present and the past. Born free, by contrast, simply means in the most ideological, perverse, and dangerous way possible, there's nothing left to fight for, nothing left to fight about, nothing left to fight over, nothing left to win. The craft of holding space for young people so they can actually use the school day to think about the world they're living in and how it came to be, this is precisely what is at stake in the politics of memory, the politics of rebellion, the politics of laughter and disentangling from the wickedness of this past present of apartheid. Latoya Williams' black girlhood research not only reminds us of why it is necessary to consider who black children are in the world, but Williams explains that the hard politics of listening to the words of black children and insisting that black children be heard above the din of corruption and distractions of every type might be the most important ingredient for facing the truths of the post-apartheid present. Beloved, do you remember when there was a news headline in April 2018? Do you remember when Manly Makanya's April 2018 headline story came out reading, none of us should want to be like Winnie Mandela? Okay. Beloved, it was reminding us that news article that according to apartheid in the world, we are each other's worst nightmare. 
And the wombs that we came out of, our black mother's wombs, they produce evil. Aren't we the living proof that whatever our mothers made with their hands and their hearts is worthless? That is what the headline was doing and why it frightened me so. Because it tugged on that other natal cord, that other umbilical root that plants us in the imago and the mind of white hatred of whoever we might be. Where we are planted in the soil of white hysteria and pathology and frenzy and primitivism and repression, and who we become because of internalizing those forged memories unleashed upon the world is critical to our story. It's why we need our school days to allow us to actually learn. And while we were rejoicing to find out that Mari Kizela Mandela was finally all at once revealed on the world stage to not have been the horror show strip tease of black motherhood that white supremacy is always presenting us with, I can only explain the journalist who wrote the story as being tasked by some force to rein us in, to remind us that by virtue of her being nothing, we are nothing telling tales with pornographic characters, commenting that it was her desire to grandstand that made her show up late. We are told that she had to be dragged out of some other person's bed to show up and greet our saintly, hope-inspiring Nelson. But beloved, I do want to be like her, and I want you to be like her too. The screaming headlines reminding us, warning us that we were naive to hope to inherit her power the militant power that black women who are never allowed to be our heroes did and do the world over to end colonialism, to end slavery, to end apartheid, at least in those generations. The power that they left us to do our work now, all that they did to feed us a hunger for liberation in our mother's milk and our first sips of pop. Beloved, don't you know that we have yet to sit in the house that white supremacy made of our bodies and spirits? We have yet to burn down each and every shadow of ourselves that it crafted. And it is OK and long past time to look at those shadows and pull them out of ourselves, to come to know some other way to be ourselves, and to come to know some other way to be ourselves with each other. For me, Fatima Mir's writings have helped me work with and through different forms of trauma. So I could come to feel and rely on that part of my consciousness and political commitment that state violence did not destroy. If you, beloved, can find the words and narratives of others that can do that for you, then maybe you will be able to say that you lived in your own present. Mir's Amapekula designs a dreamscape of countless possible ways for us to be together in new ways. Thank you to all of the young people who have been active in South Africa since 2016 for giving me dreams of the possible now, for opening up conjunctures of political commitment all over the planet with your sacrifices. <clears throat> May the loneliness you must bear force you to seek out the accompaniment of the dead and the unborn, of the not human and the yet alive. No matter what they tell you, your struggle is a worthy echo of the past. Mir gave me dreams like waking up feeling forgiveness for myself and for other black people and for all the things that we have done to each other to survive white supremacy and dreams like waking up with political clarity and discernment and enough strength to face indignity with indignation. Dreams like having the heart to fight back. Dreams like remembering those of us who refused to live under white supremacy and jumped off the ship during the Middle Passage. And those of us who bear the whip to survive the Middle Passage of this moment too. Dreams that will keep me whispering to you, pressing my breath on your skin, rustling in the waves of the ocean when you return, being the taste on your tongue when you savor your favorite meal. Beloveds, I love you. And as Nettie wrote to Celie in the color purple, though you cannot always see me or feel me, the part of me that is a black mother the part of me that has some kind of political commitment worth something, the part of me that's a black internationalist feminist, I am not dead. Thank you.
Thank you, Professor, for you know tackling that itchy subject of how the